I expected some others, but it wasn't to be, so I reckon, uh, well, I know that all of us are here that's supposed to be here, and that we're all in our appointed place at the appointed time for the appointed purpose that God set forth from before the foundation of the world. A lot of people don't believe that, but that's all right. Their unbelief doesn't change it. Doesn't matter. If millions disbelieve the truth, the truth stands regardless. And that's, uh, that's a very important, very important thing. On the same page that we were, 111, let's sing the next hymn there, which is uh, short. Some of y'all may have heard me and uh, Ed Poole talk about Brother Lloyd Wall out of Texas. This is one of his favorites and one that uh, he used to use as an opening hymn. Many, many, many times. I guess probably I've heard him call that for an opening hymn more than any. <laughs> Tis religion that can give sweet. to stand in thy presence. And we know that we can't stand in thy presence except through the merits of our Lord Jesus. We beg to be clothed upon with his righteousness from on high, that we might stand before thee complete, whole, without spot, blemish, or any such thing, that regardless of the filthiness of the flesh, thou hast covered it in that blessed robe of righteousness. Now look down upon us as we're gathered together this morning. Let us have no desire in our heart but to exalt our Savior. To praise his name. To give him all the glory that we can knowing that he deserves so much more. Heavenly Father, be with all thy gathered sheep wherever they are. Touch them. Dwell in their midst. Like we ask for ourselves, cause their praise to spring up to their Lord. 
For it's in his name we ask. Amen. I want to read a couple of verses this morning. From the book of Ephesians. I reckon we'll I reckon I'll begin with verse 14. Read through the end of the chapter. For this grace I bend my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from out of whom every family in heaven and upon earth is named, that he should give to you according to the riches of his glory, power to be fortified through his spirit in the inward man for Christ to dwell through the faith in your hearts in love being rooted and founded that you should be competent to perceive with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the knowledge of Christ, uh, to know the love of Christ which exceeds knowledge, that you should be filled in all the fullness of God, and to the one being able, above all, to do superabundantly what we ask or comprehend according to the power operating in us. To him be the glory in the congregation in Christ Jesus to all the generations of the eons of the eons. Amen. Paul's praying a prayer here. You can go back and read Ephesians 1, 2 and the beginning of 3 and read probably some of the most sublime language describing the doctrine of Christ Jesus in the whole of the New Testament. It's such that it will, if you have a hope of eternal life, I believe it will stir your spirit, stir your heart, and you will praise your King even more when you realize what he has done. And now he's saying, for this favor, for this grace, for this which God has done, I'm bowing my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter whom, every family on earth, in the heavens, wherever they are. Because saints of God, I'm going to tell you that if you look at this the way Paul wrote it, and you look at it with the understanding that people have, the saints of God are a family. They are. We are a family. There's so many 
so much different language used in the scriptures to describe the saints. Well, there's one right there, saints, holy ones. He calls them that later on. The holy ones. Compared to a garden. Now think of the hymn, we are a garden all around, chosen in the peculiar ground. A city. New Jerusalem. The temple. All of these things. But I believe when we think about the eternal relationship between God and his people and the relationship in which he placed them in Christ Jesus, that family is the best way to describe it. What did Jesus pray in the 17th of John? Thine they were. So God had this people before the foundation of the world. God had this people before there was any notion of creation, so to speak. They were his. And because they were his, he could do with them as he pleased. Now let's mark that down right plainly. God can do as he pleases with his people. And I want to submit to you that God has two kinds of people that he can do what he wants to with. The one are his by virtue of creation. And that's it. Because he's their creator and the God of creation... He can do with them as he pleases. And you know it's interesting that those who claim the name Christians many times will give God, give God, yeah, the authority to do as he will with the rain, do as he will with the wind as long as it's not too bad a storm. But oh no, he can't do anything with people. And then he has those that are his by relationship. They are the ones that he loved. And in his love, he took them and gave them to his son and gave his son to them. It's interesting the language that Jesus used. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. The Calvinistic world wants to say, you gave them to me. But that word to is not there. He gave them Jesus. And he gave Jesus to them. Let us never forget that the whole, complete, ball of wax, as it were, that we call salvation, finds its beginning, its progression, and its ending in one person. And that person is not you, and it's certainly not me. It is Jesus Christ and Him alone. And when we start looking outside of Him for anything in the, that salvation, well, we've missed the point of what the apostle said that we were doing. Well, what's that? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Do you have faith? Do you believe? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I went down to the front and made my belief and profession in Jesus. January 13th, 1972, whatever. Doesn't mean a thing. Did Jesus give you faith to believe that he is the one who bore the sins of his people on the tree and poured out his blood for every one of them that God gave him? All of the family. Who was the one? Think about this. 
Who was the one who could redeem another soul under the law? Could I redeem any of y'all? If there was a problem, I'm not a kinsman to you by blood, am I? Had to be your near kin. And if the near kin wouldn't do it, then the next one. And you just keep going further back till you found one that would. Go read that in Ruth and Boaz, the story of them. They, they, uh, they'll explain that better than I could in this short length of time that we have together today. We have him as a kinsman. Because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he likewise himself took part of the same. Family, your elder brother, your husband. The saints are called the bride, aren't they? We're the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're the children. A lot of people wonder about that text in Isaiah where it says his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. If you're a child of God, he's your father as well as your brother, as well as your husband. He is all things to you. I think about the new birth. And when we're talking about being born of the Spirit, Spirit of Jesus that indwells you. It's His Spirit. You go into the great cathedrals and religious palaces of the world and you look at their pictures and their stained glass windows with pictures and you see a little white bearded man and you see a handsome young man and you see a dove and what did you get the idea of? Well, that's three gods. And despite all of their claims to the contrary, that's really what they believe. Because think about it. They believe God the Father does this stuff here. He did everything in eternity. Jesus does everything in time through his lifetime, and then the Spirit does everything for us now. They divide it up. Instead of cutting a straight furrow, they divide up the ground. Listen. Hear, O Israel, Lord thy God is one. Jesus, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Philip, he that seen me has seen the Father. Thomas, you don't claim you saw Jesus. I ain't going to believe it till I put my finger in the holes in his hand and thrust my hand in the wound in his side. Here he comes. Enters into him, says, hey, Thomas. Here's my hands. Here's my side. Do what you said you were going to. And rather than do it, he falls down and says, My Lord, and all oh, most of the so-called Christendom today wishes he to stop right there because you could make my Lord mean almost anything. But he went further and said, My Lord and my God, let us never forget that Jesus is the manifestation of God on earth, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why he could die for our sins. That's why he can forgive us. That's why the God forgives us is because God in human flesh took care of the problem of sin once and for all.
for his children. And there's nothing now for us to do about it. See there, I knew it, y'all. You, you old absoluters, all you say is y'all ought to go out and sin all you can. You need to just live in as much sin as you can. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that when we sin, it's already forgiven. It's already under the blood. That the handwriting of ordinances that was against us was covered with the blood of the cross. And now the law has nothing in us. Because our head, you won't get this down to a fam familial relationship that's even greater than any of that other. How were the saints of God chosen? Let me rephrase that. To what were the saints of God chosen to be in eternity? He's the head, they're the body. Let's never forget that. That the head cannot be without the body, nor the body without the head. They're inseparable. We make up his body from eternity to eternity. I don't know about y'all, but I have a hard time comprehending that. Just exactly. Like I have a hard time comprehending this right here, where it says, and I know I'm skipping some, but it kind of goes on here. To know what's the width, the length, the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ, which exceeds knowledge. How can you know the height, the depth, the width, the love, the length of the love? God. The only clue I think we have of it in this lifetime is when we are blessed to look at the New Jerusalem, that four square city whose height, length, breadth, and depth is equal. And when we see that that is the place for the redeemed of God from all ages, from Adam, if he was one, all the way down to the last one, then we can have somewhat of an idea of these things. But just to sit here and try to imagine it? Oh, brother. I can't do it. I can't. No matter how much I'd like to. And, and I'll admit, my imagination is such that I'd like to. But I can't comprehend it. No more than we can comprehend anything concerning this God with which we have to do. You know, Paul, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians, in one of the Corinthian epistles, says we see through a glance darkly. But the time's coming where we'll see face to face. There won't be a glass there. Oh, that's a day. I'm reminded of the line that in the verse that's not in our books for come thou found of every blessing. Oh, that day when freed from sin I shall see thy lovely face. Richly clothed in blood-washed linen, there I'll sing, redeeming grace. Come, dear Lord, no longer tarry. Bear my raptured soul on high. Bid the words thou spakes to Moses, bid me get me up and die. 
we'll see him as he is. Then we'll know, even as we'll know. That's a scary thought. It is. I think of the knowledge that mankind has. Now, I'm talking about secular knowledge. Now, I'm not talking about spiritual knowledge. I'm talking about the sec secular knowledge out there. Knowledge being run to and from knowledge shall increase and we've seen it. Even though there's nothing new under the sun, it seems to us like knowledge has certainly increased over the years. God knows all that and more. More? Well, yes, more. The heart is desperately wicked. Above all things, who can know it? I think if you can know it, God himself can know it. And he's the only one who can. We'll know it. Even as we're done. If we, when we're blessed to be in our right minds, somebody might say that let me out, but I hope not. When we are blessed to be in our right mind and we praise our Savior for what He's done for us, because we know how sinful we are. We just think we know. We're far worse than we think. And we think that Paul, we, if it wasn't by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Paul wrote that he was the chiefest of sinners, we would think he lied because we have to be the chiefest of sinners. When you're given a sight of the depths of the depravity of your inherited nature from Adam and the depths that it runs to regardless and would run to were it not for the restraining grace of Almighty God to hold it in check. How much praise do we offer him for this? I'll be honest about it, brother. Sometimes if you saw me going down the road, you'd think I was crazy might be singing a hymn, praying, or just praising God for his salvation. Because God isn't bound to a meeting house, God isn't bound to a book, God isn't bound to anything, and when he gives you a sight of your Savior, and it's like pouring water on a dry and thirsty ground, when it's like a refreshing bit of manna to a hungry soul, you praise his name for it. Period. You want to be a can't help it Baptist? That'll make you one if you made to do that. Because you can't help but praise it. Because you know what you are by nature and you know the hope that you have through grace. Uh, from out of whom every family in the heavens upon the earth is named that he should give to you according to the riches of his glory. According to the riches of his glory. Jesus prayed in the garden, Father, glorify thou me with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. You want to know the difference between Jesus in eternity past and Jesus now? Both in heaven, right? The body that was born of Mary is now glorified in the glory of God. The eternal, everlasting glory of God. John, in his, I believe, first epistle said, We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now he was probably had reference to the transfiguration. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John up into that mountain apart, he said, y'all watch and wait here. And what did they do? Go went right to sleep, just, just like the frail man wants to do. When it went to sleep. Look at how many times that happens. You got ten virgins, five wives and five virgins. 
uh, five wise and five foolish, and every one of them was slumbering and sleeping. Jesus goes into the garden and says, I'm going over here to pray. You watch for a while. And he comes back and they're all asleep. How many times did that happen? He goes up there to the mount to commune with his father and with Moses and with Elijah. And what did they do? They went back to sleep. I, for one, am kind of glad they did because I could look at them and say, well, they're no better than I am, and I fall asleep with my Bible in my lap or next to me on the couch or something. They wake up. And there's Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. And he shines before them with the absolute radiance of God in his human body. And they were fearful. You know, you wake up out of a little slumber, a little nap, and you see a shining man in front of you. And you see two others up there in the heavens. And they're talking. Peter says, boy, it's good for us to be here. Lord, let's build us three tabernacles, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you. I think I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again if I live. I don't know how Peter knew that was Moses and Elijah, but he did. He certainly didn't live in their lifetimes, but he knew who they were. And a voice came from out of heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Showing us that the law and the prophets were until John. Showing us that all was about to be fulfilled. And now the word of Jesus stands. Not the word of the law, neither the word of the prophets. And when the cloud left, they saw none but Jesus only. So his glory. Then a foretaste of that glory that he would have at his ascension in the heaven. When he would sit on the throne of his glory. Now that's the way it's described in one place, isn't it? He shall sit on the throne of his glory. I believe that's a prophecy. Zechariah, maybe? He shall sit on the throne of his glory. Yes, and he did. And he is. And that's another thing that we can't comprehend. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The absolute glory of him who is light and in him is no darkness at all. He should give you according to the riches of his glory. I'm going to say that's a very nice, beautiful way to say he's going to give you in such a way that you can't comprehend it. Like the love. You can't comprehend the measurements of it. He's going to give you what? Power. Power. In our common King James Version, sometimes authority the Greek word for authority is translated power. Sometimes the word for an inherent, an inherent power is just translated power. And that's what that is here. 
He's going to give his power. He's the one who has power within himself. He is the one who doesn't derive his power from a secondary source. He is all powerful. He is almighty. None can give to him anything that he needs because he is complete in all of it. And he's going to take of that power and give it to you and I hope to me and to all of the family who's named in Christ power to be fortified. Man, I like that. Be fortified. Immediately, I think of Job. Satan's up there saying, or God, Satan's up there in the presence of God. God looks at him and says, if you consider my servant Job, a perfect man, upright, excuse me. He said, yeah, I considered him. You built a hedge around him. You fortified him. That's what he's saying. Look at the walls around Jerusalem. They're fortifications for protection. Oh, again, I think of the hymn. Thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates shall all be praised. That's to the real Zion. The one that the Zion, the city of Zion, was a type and a figure and a foreshadowing of. Oh, yes. He's given you power to be fortified, not because you're going out here and build a wall. How many people have taken that text in, what is it, in, in Nehemiah, where they went to work to build the wall with the sword in one hand and the trowel in the other and said, you've got to get to work now. Just like those men did, you've got to get to work. Your cause is better than theirs was. Theirs was natural, yours is spiritual. Get out there and build up Zion. Listen to the apostle. Power to be fortified through his spirit. That's the only way you're going to be fortified. That's the way you're sealed. That's the way you're sanctified. Separated. Separated. That's a beautiful thought to me. That God has separated his people in Christ in eternity. Sanctified them there. And by his spirit we are separated now. What do you mean? I thought you just said we family and joined together. That's right. But the family is separated from the world. Jesus said, I pray not for the world, but I pray for those that thou hast given me out of the world. And you might look at me and say, man, I feel like I love the world sometimes. Well, so do I. That's the old man, because the old man still does love the world. But the new man hates it. The new man doesn't want anything to do with it. That which is born from above, that which is born of the Spirit of God, that which has the fortification around it, is Christ in the hope of glory. What did he say to his disciples? The world has nothing in me. Has nothing in me? Not the world. Yes, the power to be fortified through the Spirit in the end of man. In the end of man. We got a hedge around us. Just like Job had. We got a fortification that's stronger than a natural hedge. Because Jesus has given us his spirit. Because he has formed in us the hope of glory. And we are the recipients. I know, I, I quote a lot of hymns, but I'm going to quote another one. A sovereign protector I have. And 
seen yet forever at hand. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Spirit of Jesus within us. I think about the the ones who like to call themselves spirit beings. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Charismatic. Pentecostal times. Then go back and read the Gospel of John where Jesus talked about the giving of the Spirit, don't they? They make everything to be about the Spirit coming. He's going to fall on you and grab you. He's going to baptize you. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. The Spirit is to take the things of Christ and show them unto you, not to speak of himself. So if you've got all these things happening by Spirit that's apart from Christ, it kind of makes me wonder what Spirit is. It? In the inward man, for Christ to dwell through the belief in your hearts and love, being rooted and founded. In love, being rooted and founded. Brethren, we can we could go on till next second Sunday. And we could say no more than this. Everything that God has done for his people is based on love. It's based on love. God is light. God is love. And he loved this people. That's why he gave them to his son. He loved this people, and the Son loved his body. No man hates his own body. Isn't that what Paul wrote to these same Ephesians a little bit later on? He's talking about the relationship of the natural husband and wife. When he says the two are become one flesh, and he says no man hates his own body. How could Christ hate his own body? I think about those that deny the doctrine of election, that build up the doctrine of free will. They say that God loves you. God loves you. God loves everybody. But if you don't accept him, he's going to cast you into hell. Or the real Arminians, like the like Campbellites, Church of Christ, that say, yeah, God loves you today, but you can sin and he won't love you tomorrow. Why would you worship a changeable God like that? The Molochs and Baals of this world. They're more worthy of worship than a God who is changeable in that way. God loved his people with an everlasting love. And he gave them to his son. And his son loves them so much that, that he redeemed them. That he fulfilled the type of Adam, didn't he? Adam loved Eve, the bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he was not deceived. He was not tempted by the serpent. Think about that. The serpent tempted Eve. Not Adam. Adam says, she can't come to me. I got to go to her. She's done messed up. I'll mess up with her because she's my flesh and my bones, and I love her. I have no idea whether Adam had any concept of love or not. As a word, like we would use it, but he had the feeling in his heart. I believe that. And the only reason I say that is the fruit is the fruit of the knowledge, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and love's good. Most of the time. There are inordinate loves, and we know that, but Pure love. The love of the family. 
the love that we have one to another because we see Jesus in you. Because we see that Christ is in you. Like we hope he's in us, makes you brother and sisters. In him. And in him alone. Paul told the churches that he determined to know nothing among them but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because that crucifixion death and the resurrection from it, that pouring out of the sinless blood is what redeemed the family, the body the bone of his bone and the flesh of his flesh to God. So that now we have hope of eternal life through him. Not through our works, not through any kind of deeds, not because of where you are, not because of who you are in the flesh, but because of what you've been made in the spirit. And we can't talk enough about that. And we can't tell it all. Brethren, it's been good to have been here with you. It's been good to think about the greatness of our Lord and the mercy of our God through him. Let's bow in dismission. O oh Lord, we beg thy mercy to us as we go our separate ways. We pray that thou would keep us in peace Thou would give us strength in the inward man. That Thou would give us a glimpse, not only of Thy glory, but also of Thy love. Cause us to rejoice in the fullness of our Savior. Gather us together again, we pray. In the name of Jesus we ask. Amen.